I'm going to try to take us on a little bit of a whirlwind today. I'm going to do two things. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our work on cumulative effects in northeastern Alberta, the history of where we got to, and why that led to some switches in technology and what we're trying to do with that. So we're going to talk a little bit about design, about how you assess cumulative effects and the various approaches you need to think about when you're doing it. Everything we've talked about today thus far is about point counts, and they're very valuable tools, but they're pretty coarse. And I want to talk about how sometimes if you get more precise <coughs> data, you get a slightly different answer. I want to talk a lot about scale and why it matters when assessing cumulative effects and how technology might be able to help us there quite a bit. And at the end, I'm going to introduce the idea of an ARU, which Jim has already mentioned, uh, introduce you to a group called the Bioacoustic Unit, which is a collaboration between a whole bunch of people, Environment Canada, uh, ABMI, my lab, all trying to work on the science and the technology of this and talk a little bit about something that's going to be coming up pretty exciting in a couple months. So these are the three ways we have collected data in the past on birds. We use territory mapping, so we put a transmitter on or we get bored and like to hang out with the bird all day long and follow it around and we learn everything about its whole life, which is cool, it's all fun, but it's incredibly intensive, it takes a really long time to get data and really what you learn about is how that bird uses space. The other way is called spot mapping. You walk back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and with a little bit better, not as good a resolution as following the individual bird, but you can find where he is, maybe plus or minus 25 meters, make a map of everybody you hear, and kind of get an idea of density, and also get a little bit of an idea about how the birds use space. The thing we've been talking about a lot is a point count. You stand there, you listen to everything you hear, you count it, and you're done and you walk away. That's the easiest, the fastest, you get the most species data, but it's also the least precise. So, I'm going to walk you through a case study of why this matters. So here's a study on the oven bird. I've done this bird for over 15 years of my life. And the first study I did in relation to cumulative effects was seismic lines. So everyone wanted to know, does a seismic line even have an effect? So I went out and I followed birds around all day long. And I found the one on the left, which is that oven birds treat seismic lines like a territory boundary. They live right up to the edge of it. They don't really avoid it by any great distance, but they will not cross it. Okay, One lives on one side, one lives on the other. Low impact seismic comes along a few years later. We're cutting lines every 50 meters. It's like, holy crow, if birds do that same behavior, seismic lines are gonna wipe out birds off the planet. Oven birds, they'll live across 3D seismic lines. They don't care because they're a lot narrower. It's not a big deal. They kind of have no choice. Last question that's asked, well, how do they respond to vegetation that regrows and does that matter? And the answer is yes, but it makes the story even more complicated. When you study their behavior, as the line recovers, oven birds will start to incorporate in the territory much more often but it's far more likely that they will do that behavior if there's only a few birds around. If you're in a low density place, it's no big deal to just hang out across the line because there's nobody there to have a territorial fight with. If you have lots of individuals, that seismic line actually acts as a territory boundary for the life of the line. It can be, the trees could be 15 meters tall and they'll still treat it as a boundary because it's different than the forest beside it. It makes a nice place to make a break. So that tells me a lot about what seismic lines do. Now, take that, which is the question, is what does that behavior lead to? Well, if you'd make a theoretical geometric model, plop a bunch of circles down on a landscape, and they have this behavior of avoiding the seismic line, as you add lines to a 12 hectare plot, the density should do that. It should go down by a certain percentage. Now, in reality, when you go out and do spot mapping and you address that question, we found we've done it in three different studies. Two of them showed that, yes, there was a slight reduction in oven bird abundance in a 12 hectare plot. About 5%, 3%, a really small effect, but that's exactly what you'd expect based on the behavior. But in other places, like Angstrom Lake, we couldn't find the effect at all. It's a subtlety, right? I looked at it really incredible detail, but the density wasn't something that changed a lot. But behaviorally, we're seeing something that's quite obvious. Now, let's scale that up again. Now, let's use point counts and let's use a landscape. So those red circles might represent your point count stations. The blue circles would represent the oven birds' territories, and the, the yellow would represent the seismic lines. In theory, if that behavior has a large-scale population consequence, you should see that magnitude of decline. If you do point counts, though, at the individual point count level, like we see here at the top, the relationship between the seismic line density and the number of birds, it's actually flat till you hit a threshold of around 8, 8, eight kil uh, kilometers per kilometer squared, and then things start to drop. But if you do it at a larger landscape scale, so, no, not landscape, I won't go that far, maybe a couple hundred hectares, which is what we see at the bottom there, you actually see absolutely no relationship. So the point is how you study the process and how you try to understand how cumulative number of lines influences the answer depends on how you measure it. 
Now here's the answer from the ABMI website, which you know, my data is contributed to all of that. It's a big pooled data set, but if you use point counts, there's a slight reduction when you move to 10% linear of oven birds. But there's a lot of complexity in there, right? So if we want to understand the details, which the energy sector very fully does, like when's my line recovered? When's it not too wide? We have to take into account some of those subtleties when we do this kind of thing. Now here's another example. So if you do point counts on pipelines or you stand on a well pad, how big a point count you do <laughs> totally influences your answer. So here what we have is, this is oven birds. If you stand there on the, po on the well pad and you do a 50 meter radius point count, you find no oven birds on the well. If you do a point count on the edge, you find lots of them, and you do them in the interior, you find lots of them. Same basic premise on a pipeline. But if I do an unlimited distance point count off a well pad, I find absolutely no effect of the well pad. Well, it's because I'm counting the birds in the bush, right? If you want to see what the effect of the pad is, the bird doesn't use the pad, but there's not a massive reduction of the number of birds in an area that has a well pad in it, because a well pad's one hectare out of, you know, five that you probably sample with a point count. What this figure just summarizes is that if you look at seismic lines, pipelines, and well pads, okay, the magnitude of the response, the number of significant results you get, all of those components depend on how you do the point count. So the influence that these have in terms of how we think about these problems depends very much on the methods. Now here's ABMI's data. And again, I work very collaboratively with ABMI and BAM and all of these various partners and my lab does. How this basically works to put it in premise, I collect data, it goes into a big ABMI data set for the province. ABMI uses it to build you know, Alberta models. ABMI data, my data goes into the BAM database which helps us make continental models. So we're all accumulating the data by working together. But what we can do is we can take, you know, the model that Peter and Jim have made, and we can make predictions about how many birds are out there on the landscape. Now, so what we did here is we tried to take the local studies where we looked at all of that detail and add them up to see how well could we predict. So how we did this is we split the data, because we have huge amounts of data. We have, I don't know, 60,000 point counts that went into this. So we took our data, and I split it into the Bain BAM data set and the ABMI one. And what we did is we figured out, based on forest type, forest age, forest composition, the presence of linear features, well pads, etc., how many birds would we expect when we combined these studies in different combinations. We then predicted how many birds we would actually find when we went out to ABMI sites that have the, had these different footprints. And what that shows is this figure here. So we have predicted oven birds in an ABMI landscape, and this is what we actually observed. Now that's pretty messy, but it's not bad. It's going up like we'd expect, but we're trying to predict individual landscapes here, so an individual group of nine. So yeah, there's going to be a mess here because you know you can't fully account for time of day, the observer effects fully, those things, and there's just some stuff that the model doesn't describe, right? What's really important about this is that this model does really quite well at understanding and predicting how birds will respond to forest age and forest type. And since forestry is the primary driver of changes in the age distribution, this will work very well at understanding the forestry effects. What's important is, if I put in the energy sector effects into this model and see how well did I do at predicting what was going on with ABMI data, didn't really improve things very much. And that's because the energy sector effects that I studied, well pad seismic lines, etc., there's lots of them, but they're pretty small, and they don't really add up to a massive effect. It's within the range of the variance that you get from point counts. What's more important though is this graph here, which shows on average. So these are low impact to high impact sites. And what we're looking at is, were we doing well in our average predictions about oven bird abundance? And on average, we do fine. It's a perfect, you know, very straight linear relationship. We're, our models work well for on average. But if you're trying to predict how many oven birds are gonna be at exactly this place right here, you're not going to do that well. Now, I'll also walk you through sort of the same premise. We're doing now the similar work. The oven bird probably, honest to God, is the best studied cumulative effect species in Alberta, period. Okay, I've done a ton of work on it. We're trying to move now to species that people are maybe a little more concerned with. So we'll talk a little bit about some work that Angeline Hunt, and <coughs> master's students who defending in two weeks, did using the exact same premise. Studying density at the block level, second order use, where did the birds put their territories in relation to forestry, and then when they actually were in a f harvested block what did they actually do, which we call third order use. 
So what Angeline did is she set up a whole bunch of large grids that were about 20 hectares in size. She walked back and forth to do that spot mapping thing. She also did some point counts, and then she also did the following. She did all, all of those things to understand Canada warbler behavior in relation to forestry. <coughs> so we set up all kinds of combinations of kind of things to look at, like small residual patches, single residual trees, cut block with a larger forest matrix, a big forested stand by a cut block, riparian buffer strips, medium-sized residuals, et cetera, et cetera. But the big take home of her thesis was very interesting. The major driver, the Canada warbler, does not like harvesting. In some ways, but in other ways it kind of does. So here what we have is the abundance of males. So this is density. This is the number of animals you get when you cover the whole 20 hectares. And as the amount of harvesting increases, the number of Canada warblers is decreased. Now, if we look at it at second order, where did the birds put their territories relative to the cup blocks? They basically tended to put them in the old growth stands, but, and that, but there were some individuals who would be close to unharvested stands. And then when we have the third order, we looked at their behavior. And the vast majority of individuals never went in a harvested stand, but many of them did. Okay? Some of them, a couple, will actually have their territories completely in a cut block. But what was interesting is Angeline looked at every combination of covert you could think of, and really what she came to the conclusion was, it was the amount of harvesting. It wasn't the age of the harvest, it wasn't the structural retention, it wasn't any of those things. In fact, what drives these birds is that they're clustered together. This is a graph showing the abundance of males and the distance to the next occupied survey block. What that indicates is that the birds are close together. They pack together in these areas, independent to some degree of the habitat. They actually have what's called a semi-colonial breeding structure. So that's interesting because they're packing together in this way that might create some conservation strategies that are a little bit different. If you find a cluster, probably not a good place to do harvesting. If you're not finding a cluster, it's gonna be one or two birds and that doesn't happen very often. Okay, so the birds are this clustered kind of clumpy nature. Go to Slave Lake and hang out at the bird observatory and you see this very obviously. The birds are very close. Okay, so I've gone through a very rapid fire of why scale matters and a variety of things like that. What I'd like to now switch gears is that took me 10 years. There's a lot of birds who if I take 10 years at a time to answer all these questions, it's going to be forever before we have conservation strategies in place. So what we need is Figuring out how, many, how often do we need that level of detail, when are we going to use it, what other data is useful to get, and more importantly, how do we do it cost efficiently. So this is where I'm going to talk about ARUs and its ability to replace some or maybe even all of those methodologies. So Jim talked about this, the idea of an ARU. So I've been using these for about five years now. This is the oldest version called the SM2. We have a lot of other ones. And we built this group called the Bioacoustic Unit. And the unit is all about trying to figure out how to use ARUs in new and novel ways. But more importantly than anything else, it's also about creating a system to deal with the data. I've been a member of the Boreal Avian Modeling Project for since its inception. And one of the things that frustrated the hell out of me was actually trying to get every person's point count data in Canada. We all did it different. And it was horribly messy. And it was a painful exercise to get the data later. We had to spend years cleaning up the data. ARUs are 10 times worse if we don't do it right. We're going to have this mess, mass of data that people don't know what to do with. But what an ARU does, as Jim says, you put it out, you leave it out, and it gives you hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of recordings at any given point. You can visualize the sound, you can do all kinds of stuff. I have over 2 million recordings already. About 40,000 of those have been listened to by a human. I got a lot of data left. 100 plus terabytes of data. But we now are sampling everything. If it makes a sound, I count it. So we have work on owls, bats, um, woodpeckers, and we're doing some work even on canids and deer vocalizations in the fall. We manage data for multiple partners in our system that I'll talk a little bit more, but we have 8,200 locations already. Glenn, for example, um, you know, has some data down from around cameras. Rather than develop his own data management system, he just uses ours. It's all password protected. He can get his own data. Nobody else can see it without his permission. And it provides a great place to put it all. Now, some of the other things we're trying to do with this technology. So, spot mapping and individual territory mapping. An ARU, you just stick it out. All it's counting is all the birds that it hears. But if you use them in an intelligent way, you can actually learn way more. So each one of these is an ARU. And this is a well pad that I flow, flew with the drone. So I can get 3D photogrammic representation of the well pad. This is the structure on it, et cetera. What I'd really love to know is, 
Are the birds living on the edge? Are they living on the pad? How much time do they spend on the pad? All that kind of stuff. So if you put out a bunch of ARUs that are time synced, that is, they have a GPS time clock on them, the sound of a bird singing here will arrive at that one earlier than it arrives at that one or that one, because sound travels at a fixed rate. As a consequence, I can actually use that information to figure out exactly where the bird is. And in fact, we can do it within two to three meters. So I can figure out that the bird is spending all this time on the pad, here on the edge. So here are some examples of points that we can identify of individual birds and where exactly, very accurately, they're, they're, they, they are. And so here are some examples of the kind of maps that we can make. I can do a conventional point count with the same technology, but by simply using more ARUs, I can get that higher resolution data. But the nice thing is, I get territory maps of every single individual bird of every individual species, unlike the other way where I had to follow them around all the time. I'm getting old. These are heavy, but once they're out, they're out. And you don't have to do anything else. Now, Chuck mentioned the idea of like, you know, yeah, but all that data, how the hell are we going to deal with it? And it's a good point. So we're doing a lot of work on this. Right now, there's some commercial software called SongScope, and there's a few other things that have recently come out where you can program it to find the bird, OK? Now, these work with different levels of success. So Julia's used it on the barred owl and a few other owl species. And I want to highlight a couple things. If you have a human listen to it, we found 12 stations with barred owls, 73 with boreal owls, and 25 with uh, great horn. That's just from a human smacking on a pair of headphones and listening to the data. If you get the computer to do it, we got 37, 55, and 117. Now, there's some issues there, but really what the most important part of this is for owls, this took Julia 154 hours to do of listening physically. This, on the other hand, the computers took weeks to do it, but she did it in less than a day validating that the hits were correct or not. So she got way more data for way less time. Now, we're working on right now with uh, a variety of uh, groups in the States and at the University of Alberta with something called deep uh, convolutional neural networks and deep learning. And what we're doing here is this song, the song, uh, sorry, the software that's available right now is single species at a time. This, we are going to build networks that can identify every single species in a recording simultaneously. Right now, with 24 species, we can get 97 to 98% accuracy in classification. And what that means is, if you give me a clear signal of a bird, I can tell you what it is 98% of the time. If you want, it's in the top three species, I'll be right 100% of the time. Identifying a, uh, a signal of a known bird is not that hard. What's hard is actually going through the recording and finding the bird first and then classifying it. And that's the thing that we're working on and that will take a little bit more time. Some of the other cool stuff though we could do with ARUs. So Emily who's in the back here, she's working on the all sided flycatcher. We know a lot about bird singing behavior indicating their status. So what she's done is this is a male arriving on site. It's singing an average of 11 times per five minutes. As soon as it finds a female mate, it sings 4.6 times per minute. When it's building its nest, it's 2.7 times per minute. When it's incubating, it's less than 0.1. And when it's feeding young, it goes up again to 0.8. With an ARU, I could put it beside the bird's tree and see exactly what its singing behavior is and watch when it fails. Because what happens is when the birds fail, they start singing again. So we could actually probably get a reasonable index of breeding success simply by putting out an ARU and leaving it near a bird without having to do all that work to find the nest. Now Ellie, who's in the back, is probably got the most successful recognizer right now, working on the common nighthawk. Now Ellie is, I want to stress a couple things, common, common nighthawk. We have no data for this in the BAM data set. Very little. ABMI had very little. We thought, no, there's not many common nighthawks. Well, no, that's because we didn't count at the right time of day. If you count in the evening, you get tons of them. And what this shows is Julian date and hour. And what Ellie's been able to do is she's gone through 223,000 files, which is 1,400 hours of data, and found 138,000 um, detections of common nighthawks. Here's the map. That, sorry, it doesn't show up that well, but the red shows where we found them in, north, uh, in the lower Athabasca. But what's important here is we're going way away from presence absence of a species. This map, this not map, but this is Julian date versus hour, shows us exactly how much time they're spending at any given point. And so Ellie's been working on maps that look at, if you just use presence absence data, how would you classify the world in terms of its quality? 
versus how much time is the bird actually spending there vocalizing and what is it doing there? And so it's a totally different model and you get different kinds of answers depending on the quality of that data. Connor and Michelle have been working on sort of more communities and trying to figure out how much more data can I get about a community. So Connor's been doing this with respect to understory protection. So that's a form of forest harvesting where you leave the white spruce that's maybe this high, try not to squish it, and you let it come back really quickly. And what he's been able to find, for example, if he compares regular harvest to the understory protection that's here relative to the original stand, the understory protection is coming back much quicker, the community is recovering much faster uh, towards the original conditions than the traditional harvest. But what was neat about this is that Connor's answer depends on, and the, I guess the quality of the answer depends on how many visits he does to these stations. And what this graph highlights is how important that is. I was really mean to one of my techs, and I made him listen to the same place for two and a half weeks. And that's what this represents, is two and a half weeks of listening to exactly the same thing. The first day he did a point count, he detected nine species. Great, okay, that's what we would have used for data. This is a wetland, I will admit. But after two and a half weeks, he actually had detected 58 species of animals vocalizing at that wetland. So your perspective on what your community is and how you're representing it with one 10 minute point count, if you're interested in that particular piece of real estate, 10 minutes does not cut it. It's not even close. If you're interested in that type of, that type of wetland, maybe you'll get the whole community by sampling many, many, many points, but you're not gonna have a very precise answer about that location. So this is leading me to sort of where, um, how I'm applying this in the oil sands, is trying to bring all this together. I want to get automatic recognition. I want to get precise estimation of how animals are using the landscape. But I also need to understand population consequences. So one of the things that we're doing in this project is we have really large grids centered around highly developed sites, fully developed SAG D plays, sites that are likely to be developed into SAG D plays, and control areas that are not likely to ever have any more energy development at them. We have 100 points. Those points are sampled throughout the season so that we get amphibians, owls, songbirds, the whole nine yards. And what we're trying to get at is an actual estimate of the size of the population in these regions because we have so many points concentrated in an area. The other thing that we're trying to do is look at at what scale should we be measuring populations? Should it be four ARUs combined together? Should it be nine? Or should it be 25? Or should it be 100, right? Because cumulative effects and the principle of it depends on scale. So this allows us to look at that flexibility of scale when we're answering these questions. Finally, to wrap up, I got a lot of data. I got more data than I ever will know what to do with in my lifetime. I think I calculated I would be dead and my child would be approaching death by the time we listen to all of this physically. So what we're trying to do is make a system for people to use. It's called the Bioacoustic Information System. It will be operational in the next month or so. And what it is effectively is a collaboration between ABMI, myself, and Environment Canada in Ontario to, oops, to build a system to store this data. So we've created a cloud computing infrastructure where it's on a cost recovery basis. We will store your data. We can also you know, do the listening to you, listening for it, or we can do automatic processing if you want, or you can log in and use the system yourself on a cost recovery basis. How it basically works is this. There's a spectrogram. It slides across on the screen. You tag a box, or you actually can hit the space bar, and it'll just, you know, it'll tag that there's a bird there that you want to identify. And you make the boxes on your recordings. That then comes up that you make a label. You say, that was an oven bird, that was a this, that was a that. You enter your data. And now you have a record of where you found the oven bird in the recording, what time it happened, exactly how it's saying, all of that kind of funky stuff. There's a map that will show all the air you use in the province. It will show all of the data that people have listened to. It probably won't give you access to every single recording right away simply because of the magnitude of data we're talking about, but it will show you what's available. And then there will be another place that you can go and log in and get the actual raw data. We have cloud computing so we can scale it up really, really quickly. So if you have 20 terabytes of data, I can buy you 20 terabytes of data to store it relatively cost efficiently. Now the premise of this in the first iteration is to give humans a better tool. But the cool part about this, the best part about this, is it feeds back into that deep learning approach very, very well for two reasons. By making a box, a couple things happen. One, you've given a computer a labeled piece of data that it can use to learn what an ovenbird sounds like. So if we do this thousands of times, the computer has thousands of data points to use to learn from. 
So what we're going to be doing is trying to get as many labeled boxes from humans of good quality, and not necessarily good quality actually, because we're testing how bad quality data works as well, how that influences the ability of the, the network to learn. Once the network has learned all the species in the province, which is our goal in the next year or so, I probably shouldn't put a deadline on that. Um, what's very easy, it's not hard actually, once you draw a box as a human, a computer can tell you what's in that box with very high certainty. So the human doesn't actually have to identify it necessarily, they just need to know that it's a unique species with a unique sound, and then that can be tagged automatically. Again, the harder part is roving through it, looking around on the spectrogram, trying to find where the hell every bird is, is a more challenging problem and one that we're working on to improve all the time. Some other tidbits about things that the project or the bioacoustic unit and ABMI and others are working on is, these were some of the forestry stories, the upland stories. We've <coughs> ignored for a long time in the province of Alberta what's going on in our wetlands. We have tons of threatened species, rusty blackbird, yellow rail, olive-sided flycatcher, all are using these wetlands to a large degree. So we have about a fifth, we're going into our fifth year of monitoring some of these species up in the older oil sands. One of the other things that we're planning on doing is trying to facilitate trend estimation more quickly. As Jim said, ABMI is going back to ABMI sites right now for the second time. Well, there's a ton of data in the BAM data set that are forestry projects, they're, you know, stuff I did 10 years ago. We're going to try to go back to as many of those as we can at the same time to improve the amount of data we have for trend estimation, given that we haven't had it before. In that blitz, what I'm proposing as well is a study, it's a pilot this year, but I'd be definitely looking for forestry partners to work on this. We have tons of data from the 1990s, from Fiona Schmigelow's work, Susan Hannon's work, on how birds reacted to residual retention right when it was created. But now those are 30 years old. What's happening now? How do the birds use that residual retention now? I'd love to go back and do that. At the same time, I'd like to work with the triangulation approach to see is it the residual retention the bird is actually using and to what degree. We're doing lots and lots of work about other things like how could you estimate distance from a recording and how could you, you know, turn this into density as Peter has figured out. And we're doing a lot of work to try to figure out how to calibrate this all with the conventional human stuff. So with that, I'd like to thank a whole bunch of partners. Um, this is a very big concept, and we really hope that people will get on board. We're going to be doing a big sales job in the next few months when the system's operational, and you know, hopefully people will be interested in using it. <laughs>